welcome to Excruciating Minutia, where we'll be obsessing about sports, pop culture, politics, and other unimportant things, but mostly sports. I'm Randy, and I'll be joined today by my good friend, Stephen, and we'll be talking about a lot of different things over the course of the episodes we'll be doing on this show. Stephen, why don't you go ahead and say hello to everybody out there? Hello, everybody. That, that was a that was a good introduction. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, for anyone who's listening to this as a, a first time, uh, you've picked a good time since this is actually the first episode of Excruciating Minutia. And it's something that we've come about uh, just briefly to let uh, our audience know where we're coming from with this. Uh, Stephen and I have been friends for how long now, Stephen? Oh, boy. Too long. 20, Too long. 22 years. 22 long years. Time. We've been yeah. friends longer than I've been married to my wife and vice versa. Though yeah, our wives would wife. sometimes make jokes about that as well. So, uh yeah, uh, I uh, I live in the well. Stephen lives in a uh, in New Jersey, and I live in the swamps of Louisiana, literally. But uh, we we were uh, we were you were down here for a period of time. Yeah, I was. I lived in New Orleans for about five years um, back in the late nineties. So dating yeah, how but, old we are, right there. Yes, that's pretty bit. sad uh, that we're now we're we're now starting to get up there, but. Uh, We've been uh, we've been talking together on the phone about the excruciating minutia of life uh, and that term coming from Seinfeld, which is something we're both a fan of. And that's where. Uh, yeah, the- my wife, my wife always talked about how she was tired of listening to us talk all the phone about all the excruciating minutia of crap in the world and l- tired, just tired of listening to it and so trying now- to figure out a way to. <laughs> to do something with our time. <laughs> well, I was going to say now, uh, instead of just her listening to us talk about all the crap in the world, now we're going to force that upon the rest of the world, or at least as much of it as we possibly can, uh, which is what the show will be all about. And hopefully uh, listening to it, uh, everyone out there will enjoy it and and enjoy listening to it as much as we're hopefully going to enjoy doing it. And What's the first thing we're going to be talking about, Steve? We have uh, we kind of have breaking news this week, don't we? Kind of. Uh, well, the NFL. Well, we there's good news and bad news. It's good news if you're a fan of Miami, the Jets, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Denver, Arizona, Tampa Bay. Um, in that Green your Bay. coach, well, Green Bay already lost their coach, but at least all your coaches, as crappy as they were, got canned this week. Um, may, maybe some of the guys who got canned aren't really happy, but uh, I'm guessing the fans of those teams pretty much are. What so is, there's what's, eight, current, the, currently eight openings in the NFL. And currently uh, eight openings and maybe one or two of them are actually, actually probably two of them are, are pretty attractive, I would think. Uh, Cleveland obviously is the is the go-to for you know, but a potential coach at this point, they they seem to be on the right track. They're not the joke of the Browns that they've been for whatever number of years, literally since they restarted the franchise after the uh, the old franchise went to Baltimore. And that's we were talking about that the other day. That's been literally that was what ninety nine. I think that it was, was. ninety nine. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the the new Browns aren't. I haven't been the new Browns for a very very long time, but they've just been the terrible Browns. But there's hope. Uh, Baker Mayfield looks like he warranted the number one pick. It, he was tremendous down the stretch for the Browns. Um, so that and, you know, Nick Chubb looks like yeah, a, he was a tremendous player. the minute they got rid of Hugh Jackson. It's amazing how that works, isn't it? That's is that coincidence? <laughs> I'm not really there, sure that's coincidence. No, well, no it, such thing as coincidence. It's funny you mention Hugh because uh, a coach that we have derided over the years has been uh, has been Marvin Lewis and we've derided Marvin and we've felt such great sympathy for the people of Cincinnati who root for the Bengals all all of them that are left uh, simply because you know Marvin not not good um, for a long time yeah and the Bengals you know he has as many playoff wins I believe in Cincinnati as you do how many are you sitting on, Stephen? Uh, Is it zero? Sitting on zero. Yes, you are sitting on zero. So you and Marvin uh, managed to win, and you weren't even trying. 
to win playoff games on Cincinnati. And you've still managed to somehow or another match Marvin on the playoff win scale. So congratulations. I, I guess I should offer you congratulations. I mean, that's a, that's a heck of an Same accomplishment. To you. Hey, well, yeah, I know I I'm tied with him too. I, I've never even been to Cincinnati. So I, I feel pretty good knowing that I've, I've managed to keep up with Marvin on that. Uh, you know, Marvin really typifies the, 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 the culture in Cincinnati with football and the Brown family and just everything of just, just mediocrity. And, and they're the definition of, you know, of, of the franchise where it's like, well, we, we show up every year and we play 16 games and we win a few and we lose a few and we, we collect our revenue and we go on to the next year. And, and, you know, it's a, it's, it's about as boring as watching paint dry and, and now on the bright side, Marvin is gone, but it looks like Hugh Jackson may be the guy he's endorsing. I mean, are the Browns really going to, are the Brown family, are they really going to go with Hugh Jackson? I mean, he did so well in Cleveland, didn't he? So, I mean. Cleveland, Cleveland fans are really excited about the fact that they will be fa- potentially be facing a Hugh Jackson coach team two times a year. I can't say I would, I would blame them. Uh, I haven't seen anything in Hughes, you know, time in Cleveland that would make me think that, uh, that all of a sudden he's learned how to coach <laughs> or, I mean, he was not terrible in Oakland though. Was he? I, I, I don't think he, he was. Am I misremembering um, his time in Oakland? Um, well, I mean, they were kind of not, was he coaching in in Oakland in Oakland yeah, Hugh like Jackson yeah, Oakland, Oakland was not a Hugh Jackson on his career is 11 44 and 1 so again Hugh Jackson has been an NFL coach for a total of four seasons and he's only won 11 more games than you or I have <laughs> bringing that out there. He only spent one year in Oakland. He was eight and eight in 2011. And was Al Davis uh, an actual corpse at that point? Or was he just doing his best weekend at Bernie's impression? Or what was, was, was Al still hanging around at that point? I, I, I think Al Al Davis died during the 2011 season. Okay. So actually died, not, not, you know, we, we, we can make the argument that he had died, you know, 10 years earlier. His his ability to evaluate NFL talent and to be on the cutting edge of the NFL had died a long time before, unfortunately, he did. Uh, so he didn't. So he didn't fire Hugh. Is that correct? Is that was that Mark Davis? Yeah, well, fired well he, he couldn't have fired him. He was dead. Well, maybe he left dead. that in his. Maybe he left that in his will. I mean, you know, I want to be buried well, here. I'd like, uh, in lieu of flowers and donations. And oh, by the way give give uh he was walking papers i mean that in theory could have been what happened right well i think we Possibly. all realized that uh al davis died when he forced the raiders to pick darius hayward bay with the seventh overall pick in the 2009 draft i oh, think that, that was, was the, cool. that was that was the point i think we realized that he he was dead that he was <laughs> at least brain dead brain dead uh yes yeah, not to be confused with actual physical death but uh close enough so yeah, he didn't. That's true. Uh, Al Al died in October of 2011, so he did not actually fire Hugh Jackson. That would have been that would have been his. Uh, yeah, I guess his son. I guess his, that's Mark son. Davis. Well, Hugh, if if I'm a Cincinnati fan, I'm looking at Hugh Jackson as a potential future head coach and thinking this is exactly going to be Marvin 2.0. And and you said you you kind of suggested that that. It's going to be just a, another repeat, maybe worse. I mean, I I, I think Marvin Lewis. Oh, Marvin! I, it, Mar- hold on, Marvin has never had an zero and sixteen season as bad as he's been. That's and that's the thing. I think you're you're getting Marvin two point oh is actually you know it's a downgrade. It's not an upgrade. It's you're getting a lesser Marvin Lewis. It is. I just just an unimpressive guy i mean just uh, why why what what about hugh jackson is screaming out that that's the guy now they may not go with him i mean that's the rumors that have been kind of circulating around and marvin came out and endorsed him doesn't necessarily mean it that they're going to go with him but cincinnati 
in the past has been a team that's really gone with uh, who's the cheapest, uh, you know, who's the the easiest hire. They're they're not really ones to go outside of the box, and they're thrifty. They're th- is that is that the word for cheap uh, that makes that it sound the, like you're not cheap? That's correct. Thrifty, the thrifty Bengals. Um, so we have other, yeah, we have other openings. Um, if I'm a, if I'm a head coach and candidate, not that there are a lot of great ones. And that brings us to uh, a person we were talking about the other day. Uh, we've heard one of the jobs, uh, in New York and where was the other place? It was Jim Caldwell was being mentioned as being brought back into the NFL fold. Correct. Jets yeah. possibly. Yeah. Um, who else? Uh, I thought there was another job. He he was rumored to be a team well, that was. If I'm not mistaken, I, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't he not uh, uh, interviewed by by Green Bay? I think I think you may be correct on that. And um, we were debating the merits of Jim Caldwell. And again, for anyone who hasn't heard our conversations over the years, uh, Jim Caldwell, uh, we weren't sure 100% that he wasn't doing a weekend at Bernie's imitation over his time at Indy and uh, in Detroit. Because, uh, you know, we always hear the jokes about Eli Manning face or Peyton Manning face or, you know, there's Jim Caldwell face, which is a sign of, you know, somebody needs to get a mirror under his nostrils and make sure he's still breathing because, the man showed seemingly never, never showed any emotion or any sign of actual physical life while he was on the sidelines. And you were saying, Stephen, that that you didn't think that, that you thought that that would be kind of almost like a retread hire if if they if somebody hired him. Well, Correct? well I, mean, I mean, he kind of is the definition of a retread. He's had two other coaching opportunities where he's been he's had limited success, but not tremendous success. Um and, you know, but, but I guess that's, uh, in progress. his career, in his career though. And this is what I, I didn't find it surprising. I'm, I actually, this kind of fell in line with what I thought, but it was the, the second part of this. We discussed that as an NFL coach, 62 and 50 is called well, uh, that's a 554 winning percentage. He did make a trip to a Super Bowl, uh, granted with, uh, a team that Tony Dungy essentially put together in the 2009 Colts. Uh, lost. That's the one that lost to the Saints um, and the the Darren. Uh, who was that with the with the pick with the pick six that that sealed it for the uh, uh, Por- Tracy Porter? Tracy Porter. I almost said somebody else, and that would not have been the guy I was thinking of. Um, yeah, Tracy Porter with the pick six who who sealed it off of and gave us Peyton Manning face in that game. Um, then they they lost to the Jets the next year, and then Peyton suffered his injury, and the Colts went two and fourteen without him because that's what happens when you when you run through a disastrous uh, backup quarterbacks uh, that they did. That that was the suck for luck campaign uh, when luck was going to be presumably the number one uh, pick the following season, and the Colts were so terrible, and and it was just a just a disastrous season for for Indianapolis and for Caldwell, mainly because he lost his job. They fired him and went with a, went with a new coach and and a new direction. Uh, Their quarterbacks that year. I mean, just to show you how important the quarterback position is and what, and leading back to the coaching changes into the job openings, why some of these jobs are actually going to be very attractive to people. You know, their, their quarterbacks after, uh, after, after Manning, uh, that year were were just ab- uh, abysmal. Uh, they were. Let's see here. They were in that season. Uh, Dan, Dan, oh God, Dan Orlovsky, best known for running out of the back of the end zone when he was with the Lions, when when for no reason to take a safety because he just didn't know where the back line was. Uh, Curtis Painter was another quarterback, not an actual, they might as well have had an actual painter, uh, uh, you know, someone from a Craigslist quarterbacking rather than Curtis painter. I mean, that's, it's amazing what a, what a difference uh, a quarterback can make, but yeah, that was your, that was your 2011 Colts that went two and 14 and Caldwell was canned and the Lions hired him. And this was the surprising stat was that he actually with the Lions 
apparently uh, was the first Detroit head coach with more than one season. They had a winning record since Joe Schmidt, who coached in the late 60s and early 70s. His winning percentage is the best for a Lions head coach since Buddy Parker, who we talked about sounds like a some rock and roll guy from the 50s, and that's when he coached, was in the 1950s. I don't think, did he tour with the Crickets? Is that Was that Buddy Parker in the Crickets, or was that... This is Buddy Holly in the crickets, right? That was the, yeah. Oh, not oh that you didn't need the crickets. Not, not those crickets. Okay, not, gotcha. Not the, not those crickets. Um, so Caldwell, I mean, is are there better candidates out there? I mean, if you're if you're an NFL owner, who are you uh, who are you looking at? Who are you attempting to to go with? Who's out there? Well, Josh I think McDaniels. What, yeah, I think he's he's probably high up on the list. I think I think everyone. Uh, is kind of looking for the next Sean McVay, right? Or, or the next, uh, uh, who's the, who's the guy, uh, Nag, Nagy in, in Chicago, you know, two guys who kind of young guys who, uh, got their jobs and have really done incredibly well. Um, uh, turned around a couple of franchises that looked like they might be headed in the wrong direction. So, you know, there's well, so you're looking for the, you're looking for the next nu- new young guy. You know, the, I think the new uh, New England uh, defensive uh, coordinator Brian Flores, who's 37, 36, 37, something like that. Um, I don't know. New England's defense wasn't all that great, but um, but he he's he's getting uh, a lot of hype. Um, I, my thought on McDaniel's is is that after what happened with the Colts, going back to the Colts again, as we were, seem to be steering back to them, uh, his kind of backing out of that Colts job last year, it makes you wonder what's going on, and will teams interview him? Are teams going to be afraid that he's going to do the same thing again? I always got the feeling he was being groomed to c- replace Belichick at some point, but he did kind of take that indie job and then changed his mind last year. So my, my guess is that they may have made him an offer. He couldn't refuse type of deal where he, you know, stay here for another year or two. And, um, uh, you know, cause, cause Bill is Bill Belichick is not getting younger as they would say. He's, he's not. He's and, younger. and let's be honest. Uh, if, if I, if I'm Bill Belichick, I think I'm leaving the minute that, uh, Brady leaves. Tom Brady says I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> cause Tom he, Brady yeah. retires, Josh, it's all yours, buddy. <laughs> the team is now yours. Feel free to go, to go forth and prosper with whatever crappy quarterback ends up on the roster. Uh, Good luck with that. Yep. Yeah. I, I know, another guy that the uh, that I've seen name his name mentioned is Mike Kafka, who is the Kansas City quarterbacks coach, and he's thirty one. So, you know, after what happened with um, Mahomes this with year, Mahomes this year, and you know, and Andy that's, that's... and Andy Reid guys have actually done pretty well. If you're looking at Andy Reid's coaching tree, he, he's had some success with guys who have left him and uh, gone elsewhere and, and been very, very successful. And and the irony is, is that mentioning McDaniels and Belichick, the Belichick coaching tree has not been nearly as successful. There have been people who have left his his uh, organization and moved on, like McDaniels did in Denver, who didn't do so well. And but you are correct the the Reed coaching tree, which you mentioned Nagy as a as an immediate uh, yep person from that. And as a Bears fan, because even though I live in the swamps of Louisiana, I grew up in the in the upper Midwest, the Northwest Indiana area, just outside of Chicago. So I grew up a, a Chicago sports fan, and as a Bears fan, my entire life, uh, seeing Nagy replace John Fox, who was running an offense out of like the nineteen 19- 50s or something like that and and just clearly had lost his touch as as the saying goes the game had clearly passed him by Nagy was a breath of fresh air and you see what the Bears did what he was able to do with Mitchell Trubisky this year uh very similar not not quite as successful as the McVay and Jared Goff transformation once Jeff Fisher was finally shown that literally the king of mediocre coaches Jeff Fisher I mean, he's the, their, their patron saint, basically. Uh, once he was shown the door in L.A. and golf made the leap, well, Trubisky made sort of a similar leap this year in Chicago. But as a Bears fan, I'm thrilled 
to have Nagy. I mean, I'm thrilled that John Fox is no longer there. It would have been hard to to get a worse coach than it felt like we had in Fox the last few years. But Nagy's definitely been a huge, huge improvement for him. So, um, and among, you're right, everyone's um, looking for that. Among the Andy Reid disciples or other coaches, current NFL coaches that have coached under Andy Reid, you mentioned Nagy, Doug Peterson, Ron Rivera, Sean McDermott, and Pat Shermer. So that's, that's well, the, three quarters of a pretty good coaching tree right there. <laughs> that that Pat Shermer route will we might have to wait and see on that one. That one that route might be dying a little bit, but uh we'll see. We'll give him uh, give him a little opportunity a little opportunity. See, yeah. A little chance to, yeah. to do that. One, one year's we, not enough. Now we were also talking about like Black Monday, of course, was just this Monday, and other than Green Bay. It was pretty much all the firings took place then. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, but we've also talked about there could be other coaching things that open up. And uh, one interesting one that we talked a a little bit about earlier today before the podcast was the potential in Pittsburgh. And I haven't seen anything, but apparently, or did you see something or were you just kind of speculating or I mean, you know, there's been talk and nothing coming out of Pittsburgh, but you know, everyone's basically saying, you know, they, they basically, you know, laid an egg the last month of the season. Um, they were in heck. I mean, we were talking about them not too long ago about being a first round by team, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. And they didn't even make the playoffs. So you know, I, I don't think well, I don't think they're going to they're going to fire him. But, you know, who knows? I mean, Pittsburgh's not the type of, of franchise that's going to go around firing people. I mean, they've had three they've had three coaches since 1970. Right. Yeah, they, they have been. Well, what's crazy about what's gone on in Pittsburgh this year is it's so un Pittsburgh like in that it's traditionally been an organization. That has been modeled on consistency and a lack of change and just uh, this, this, this from top to bottom, from the ownership on down stability that has been very successful for them over the years. And as you mentioned, very few head coaches, lots of success, a perennial Super Bowl contender. And this year, I don't know what got in the water in Pittsburgh, but you you we had the Le'Veon Bell situation, which was not something that you would normally have associated with a franchise like Pittsburgh that kind of took a life of its own as the whole season went on. The whole drama of, you know, is is he going to report? When's he going to report? You know, hey, for a little while, it was like you know, Le'Veon is in Pittsburgh. Le'Veon's been spotted at this gym. I mean, it was it was getting silly there for a little while till that deadline hit where everyone realized, hey, he's and to to quote the Rick Patino from way back in the day, you know, Le'Veon Bell's not walking through that door. Not that it necessarily looked like they needed him because James Conner did a really good job. And then ironically, even when Conner got hurt, uh, Samuels took over and did pretty good, making you wonder how, uh, and we talked about that earlier in the year, how much of the Bell success is Bell and how much of it is the, the offensive line in Pittsburgh. Well, and now there's the Antonio Brown drama that's going on. So, I can't imagine Pittsburgh would make a change. Here's and and we were talking about uh, ages and records. Uh, Mike Tomlin's career record. Uh, he does have a Super Bowl championship. Uh, he got that in his second season. Now, again, granted, a lot of that was remnants of Bill Cowher's uh, roster, but still, I mean, you you still have to win no matter what the players are in front of you. We've seen plenty of good teams ruined by bad coaches or managers in multiple sports. So, you know, it's still a testament that they won the Super Bowl that year. Uh, Tomlin has got a winning percentage of a uh, 659. He's 125, 66 and one over his career in Pittsburgh. He has two seasons of eight and eight, and that's the worst record they've had in what has been now three, six, nine, 12 seasons at the helm of, of, uh, of the Steelers. That's he's been there 12 that's years. Pretty impressive. He's been there 12 years. He has six division championships. He's had, uh, eight playoff appearances. So this is one of only four times he hasn't made the playoffs. You know, 
he's won 10 or more games. I, and we were talking about Jeff Fisher. Like I said, he's like the antithesis of Fisher, who was the the king of the eight and eight to hang on to my job season. Uh, Tomlin's teams have won 10 or more games in eight of those 12 seasons. And, and you know, nine, six and one this year, nine and seven back in 09 and a pair of eight and eight seasons in 2012 and 2013. You know, he made the AFC championship game back in 2016. Uh, they made the Super Bowl and lost to Green Bay in 2010. So he's been to the Super Bowl twice. How old would you guess Mike Tomlin is? This is the interesting. This is without looking it up. He was, been he, there was young. he was young when he got the job, though. I, I'm going to say he's 45. You are oh so very close. He is 46. Yeah. What franchise fires a head coach or moves on from a head coach with his success record at his age? That would be insanity, wouldn't it? Well, it it, 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 it would and be, and, would be and, so and, it's, like and it's not something that Pittsburgh does. So you know, it, but it would be something other franchises might yes. do. And and but if he Pittsburgh. and if he lost his job, he'd have another job. He'd have he'd have eight job offers in in like a day. Well, well, you mentioned there, you know, with the eight teams, which one of those teams wouldn't take Mike Tomlin in a heartbeat? Because he immediately would jump to the head of the coaching prospect list of, you know, well, who are we looking at? Oh, wait, Tomlin's available. Yeah, let's let's get that guy. Let's let's talk to him. Get his agent on the phone. So I uh, that that's a possibility, I guess. But that would be that would be kind of crazy. Yeah, um, I mean the other the four that I had listed, uh, you know, that I talked to you about before, which was Minnesota, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, and Dallas. The likelihood is very low that they would ha- that it would happen, but you know, if Dallas gets blown out in their first uh, playoff game here this weekend, hosting Seattle, you know, could you see Jason Garrett was- get, getting canned? Well, with as long as Jerry Jones is running the Cowboys, any idiocy is possible because. <laughs> It's Jerry Jones. I mean, you know, that's that's what you you almost expect the unexpectedly stupid and ridiculous to come out of that. Um, what's amazing about this NFL season has been how many teams that just literally came out from nowhere and were looked like they were just dead and buried who managed to make the playoffs. And we talked about Pittsburgh collapsing. Right. And and they looked like they were headed for a bye and all of a sudden they didn't even make it. Well, for all these teams that that did that, there were there were teams that really pulled great second halves together. Dallas looked like Garrett was on the way out and, you know, they lost that Monday night game to Tennessee. Then, of course, they make the trade for Amari Cooper and the offense kind of picked it back up. They go on a run. They win the division and Garrett probably saved his job. Uh, Harbaugh in Baltimore, that's one of the the ones we had also discussed, looked like a dead man walking because um, their ownership had said in the offseason, you know, basically it's it's playoffs or else. This is, we need to make the playoffs. So there was a point where Baltimore looked like they were just languishing. And then Flacco gets hurt and Lamar Jackson takes over. And all of a sudden, a dynamic new offense, uh, whether that's a sustainable offense for long term, I don't necessarily think so. I think Lamar Jackson's going to have to learn how to how to work better out of the pocket. Uh, he certainly has the the capability of doing that. I think, uh, but uh, you know, they they inserted him in. They changed the entire offense around, which is actually a testament to Harbaugh's coaching and to that staff that they were able to really reinvent themselves in, in the middle of the season and and make the playoffs. Uh, the other one you had listed was Minnesota. Well, that didn't quite go as well as they expected because they had Super Bowl hopes after last season's playoff run. They get rid of Case Keenum, who was serviceable and more than competent and put up a a very good season in Minnesota. And they spend all the money on Cousins, and with that was the the expectations of a Super Bowl run. And, and Minnesota ended up out of the playoffs and, and a huge disappointing year. And you know, does that does that put you on the hot seat? I, maybe it does. I, it I, might. I haven't it heard might. again. I haven't heard that. I, I certainly think that that at this stage, 
maybe not now. You know, maybe that's not a, a, a job that's going to be opening up at the moment type of thing because it's one season. They, they, they did do very well last year. They, they lost in the title game to the Eagles, right? And Nick Foles, the Cinderella story that he's attempting to repeat for this year. But if you're, um, you know, if you're a Viking fan, you came into this season expecting that you were going to, uh, that you were going to uh, compete or go or have at least a chance to go to the Super Bowl. If you're Mike Zimmer, you, you know, that certainly was your goal. And and you thought that Cousins was the piece that was going to put you over the top. And eight, seven, and one after a 13 win season and missing the playoffs is not with, with it, presumably you're an upgrade at quarterback is not really what you wanted. So, well, we actually talked about that this weekend with, um, Kirk Cousins uh, going into this weekend's game in in games again in his career in games that he started against f- teams that were 500 or better he was four and 24 going into this weekend and I, I, lost. I, I, so he's now me. four and 25. I still can't believe that stat. It feels like you 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 literally had made that stat up because I can't believe anybody could be that badly played that or not you know i'm not saying he played that badly or all those losses were on him but that's just an amazingly bad mark right i mean that's it's hard to do i i mean even even bad quarterbacks don't do that poorly um so yeah i was shocked i was shocked as, as much as as you were when i saw it on the broadcast and they were bringing it up that he's just not a big game quarterback and you know that all of his wins for the most part have come against substandard competition. So he's kind of a, you know, he's an average quarterback, which is why he was drafted in the third round. You know, he wasn't really that highly touted coming out of college. He was a decent college quarterback, but nothing great. He was nothing that anyone, you know, every team passed on him at least twice. Right. Um, Yep. And there were plenty of teams four, five, I guess that was about five years ago. Now, plenty of teams five or six years ago that were, in need of quarterbacks that said, Nope, he's not our guy. And looking, I mean, even the team that drafted him didn't think he was their guy for the longest time. Cause RG three, and you know, if RG three and, and you know, uh, in another classic, what if type situation, if RG three is not playing in that playoff game, which he probably should wasn't healthy and he was, he was hurt and got hurt worse. You know, Shanna Hannigans, right? I, I believe was was what was going on, uh, and you know, and then maybe Cousins never even gets a chance in Washington. But um, but you know, let's yeah. be honest. They Washington wasn't really how confident were they in in RG three when they drafted him in the first round, and then two rounds later took another quarterback. That just looked bad. Well, that looked bad right out of the gate. That's Daniel Snyder, though, isn't it? Uh, I mean, and yeah. again, another owner that just that makes you wonder, you know, who, who gets his hands involved and helps make decisions that he really shouldn't be making. I mean, Washington's been a train wreck for a number of years now, and it's it's all it's, it's so many of these franchises, both in, in the NFL and you see it in, in other sports as well. The ownership is so key to a successful endeavor. And when you have bad owners making bad decisions, bad things happen. And again, Washington fans, I, I, I cannot imagine that there's very many of them that are, are big Daniels. If you talk to Washington fans, if you could go and, and do a poll or catch them coming out of a game, what do you think of Daniel Snyder? I, I think the general re- reaction would be, God, I wish we had a different owner. <laughs> Why can't Robert Kraft be our owner? <laughs> you know, who who hires the coach and and basically says, you know what, your game. You know what you're doing. You go do you you do you and you win. And I'm just gonna write, I'm just gonna sign the checks and I'm not really gonna do a lot of influence in what goes on. And that's not Daniel Snyder, and that's a large part of why Washington's been a been a mess. Yeah. But all right, let's move on. Uh Let's uh, let's take a look at the NFL wild card weekend and let's do some predictions. Um, and I, th- I have a stake. I have a stake in this this weekend since my team is playing in it. So they are. They are the last game. So let's work through uh, starting with Saturday's games. Um, and you talked about a couple of teams that really were dead in the water. Well, Indy started the season one and five 
Houston started the season 0-3, and they both made the playoffs, and they're facing each other. So uh, the line on that game is Houston is favored by one uh, at home, um, and the over-under being 48. What do you like? I... Are we picking? Well, I was going to say, I guess if we're picking this game with a with a one point line, it's 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 picking who you want to think is going to win this game. Essentially, it's not like I can pick a team to cover. Uh, Vindy's covering; they're winning, right? Uh, uh, this game's not ending in a tie, so um, I, I'm going to go with Houston. Though I, I Andrew Luck has just been a, a great story this year. I, I thought Luck's career might have been over. I mean, when you go to Europe to get experimental treatment on some body part that's important to your profession, like he did, you had to think uh, maybe that the, the 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 likelihood of him coming back as a as a just a competent NFL quarterback might have been questionable. And yet, here Luck was over the last second half of the season; he was just phenomenal, and Indy and he carried Indy on his back. I mean, they were. They were fantastic, and it was it was largely luck. Houston, not the best running game. Uh, Deshaun Watson turns the ball over a little bit more than I think he'd like, but he's so explosive, and he's gotten you know healthier and I think more comfortable as the season's gone on. Uh, J.J. Watt had a, a speaking of comeback seasons, had a very very good comeback season. I think Houston has a better defense. They have the home field. I, I'm going to go with Houston in that one. Uh, as far as the over under goes, it's it's 48. I I think it's possible. I don't really like betting over unders. I'm, I'm I'm terrible with that. But I I'm and, and every prediction I make is going to be wrong anyway. So I mean, as we already know between us talking over over time, it's the whole get to Vegas theory that I can pretty much say what's going to happen. So you know, I'm I'm going to pick Houston. So get to Vegas and put your money on the Colts. Uh, covering that outright with the over, but I like, I like Houston. So I also thoughts? like Houston. I think they're, I think their offenses are pretty comparable. Um, neither of them have a tremendous running game. It's mostly passing, um, but Houston has a better running quarterback and um, you know, Lamar Miller's actually been pretty serviceable as he's uh, as health, you know, when he stays healthy this year, he's been pretty decent. Um, and I just like Houston's defense better than Indy and the home field advantage only giving up a point. I'll take Houston. And I definitely like the over on this game. There you go. Uh, second matchup. We'll get your thoughts on it first. We have a uh, Seattle headed to Dallas. Well, this and this again, to me is easy. Uh, this, this is, this is like, you know, this is my stone cold lock of the week. Okay. Always bet against Dallas in the playoffs. <laughs> Always bet against that. Well, Tony Romo is not. It doesn't matter. Anymore. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Jason Garrett is still the, still the coach. I, I, I uh, give me give me a Pete Carroll coach team over a Jason Garrett coach team any day of the week. Um, and and let's be honest, this is this is going to come down to quarterback play, a game like this, and I trust Russell Wilson a whole lot more than I trust Zach uh, Dak Prescott. You trust the guy with two Super Bowls and one Super Bowl win over I, Dak Prescott. I, the, the guy actually, and, and let's be I'm honest, he well. should have two Super Bowl wins. It, well, if Pete Carroll, well, you say Pete Carroll over over Jason Garrett. Pete Carroll is the guy who who didn't follow the Madden principle. Which, which by the way, this is as good a time as any just to have a very quick divergence from uh from what we're talking about to ex- explain something a term that we're going to use uh, over the course of the life of this podcast which is my madden principle or my madden theory and i'm bringing it out now because how long have i been espousing the madden theory how, how long has how long has how the madden years? game been out it's been out, out for a long long time and it's been out for as long as we've known each other so 10 12 years would you say and I think I saw somebody reference it um, on 548 on ESPN. Somebody kind of did. So uh, one of the things that spurred us into doing this podcast is, as your wife said, we've talked about so, so many of these different things. This is something we've been talking about for years. And and I so I, I want to get it out there. I've been talking about this for years. So any Johnny-come-latelys can 
can maybe someone else said it 12 or 15 years ago, but you've heard it from me so many times. The Madden principle, the Madden theory is that when a head coach or a manager, if it's baseball or a head coach in basketball or whatever the sport is, does something strategy wise or, or play wise or whatever, that the 11 year old who's sitting at home playing Madden looks up and says, wow, that was really freaking stupid. Then it's, then it's a terrible, terrible idea. It's a terrible play. And and the coach should be called out on it. Uh, the 11 year old playing Madden would have 100% run Marshawn Lynch into the end zone in that Super Bowl. And you're right. Russell Wilson would have two Super Bowl rings because Pete Carroll, as good a coach as he is, failed on the Madden principle, the Madden theory that night uh, and and cost his team the game. And if you ask Pete Carroll today, he'll still defend that call, which is mind boggling to me because you have beast mode, you have Marshawn Lynch and you have a guy that New England could not stop. And yet they didn't give him the ball. And you have and, a quarterback who's and, really good at running. Yeah, even that would have been a bootleg would have been. You know, a, a misdirection bootleg would have been a better call than than that pass. It, and it's easy to say, well, that's Monday morning quarterbacking. You know, if he doesn't throw the pick, well, he did. <laughs> so we, you know, that is what happened. So right. know, he was put he was put in a position that. to throw the interception. I mean, just about any other play would have had a better end result, or you know, couldn't have been any worse. Let's put it that way. Um, it, it, exactly, couldn't um, have been. But but going but going back to the Pete Carroll thing, despite failing on that night with 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 the Madden principle, my thought is is that Jason Garrett fails as probably as often or more often than Carroll does. Seattle's got the better Seattle's got the better quarterback. Um, Dallas has a I think a better big play receiver in Cooper. I I'm still I'm not sold on Prescott being able to to make the plays that Wilson can. Dallas has a better running back. And Elliot, I think the the X factor here is how good Seattle's defense has actually been, even with all the losses from what we remember their dominant defense being from a few years ago in the Super Bowl. Carroll has kind of reconstructed that defense, and they've actually been really good. And if I had to pick uh, an upset, because we're going to talk about a game that I that I see the line, and I'm not necessarily sure that that's a would be an upset if Dallas is favored in this game and you're telling me, well, pick one road team to win. That's, that's an underdog. I'm with you. I'm, I'm going with Seattle in this game. And for the, by the way, to uh, answer the question that we asked um, earlier, um, Madden football, John Madden football debuted in 1988 for the Apple two series of computers. Wow. Break out your Apple II and play some Madden. The graphics, I'm guessing, were not quite as uh, not quite as uh, high tech as they Neither are Neither was today the playbook, on, consi- on your, considering uh, that Madden provided uh, EA Sports the 1980s Raiders team playbook. I I think the Raiders might have still been running that playbook in Hugh Jackson's uh, <laughs> season in, in, in Oakland. <laughs> Oh, they might God. still be running it today. They might still be running it today with Gruden. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, you know, Gr- Gruden is all about the throwback. Gruden's a topic for another time. We'll have plenty uh, of plenty of. You know, uh, I I just thought of a great of, line that I com- we completely missed on when we were talking about uh, Cincinnati and the possibility of Hugh Jackson um, being the coach. I I think I'd rather have Hugh Jackman as my coach. You know. <laughs> Wolverine exactly. is my head coach. Yeah, yes. absolutely. I, I missed absolutely. my opportunity. I got to get what? better at this. Hugh it's Jackman fail rather here. than Hugh Jackson. I, <laughs> I just wanted to try out that that uh, oh, that sound effect. That sound yeah. effect. Hugh Jackman is head coach. Like I said, he and you know Hugh Jackman can sing and dance too, so he can distract the crowd if yes. uh, if the team sucks, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> or he can just whip out his claws. All right, well, let's Your get choice. back to this. Um, uh, you picked, so your pick was well, uh, Seattle or Dallas? I, I'm going with Seattle. I'm, I'm going with Seattle. Not, I'm going with Seattle to outright I don't really win. Like the fact that you're choosing the same things that I am. That's really the bad. <laughs> you know, now everyone really needs to get to Vegas. Yeah, this is disturbing. Or New Jersey well, or I'll, anywhere else I'll, there's sports, legal sports betting. I, Mississippi has it now, right? Right near where you. 
Mississippi, Mississippi yeah. does have it. Uh, Louisiana will have it as soon as someone gets bribed enough money to bring it here. Oh, did I say that? You did. I and mean, my guess yeah, is well, it being Louisiana, it won't take long for that bribe to arrive. That's probably right. the case. So uh, we'll go to the third game. That's going to be the, the not San Diego Chargers, the, Clip, the Clippers, uh, the L.A. Chargers, the Clippers or whatever they are uh, facing Baltimore. And you're showing a uh, that Baltimore is a, currently a three point favorite, three point game. favorite. So which so, which, you know, considering it's in Baltimore, that's basically a pick em you, game, right? Uh, it, it pretty much is. Uh, who do you who who do you got? Well, I saw the first game between the two and the uh, the Chargers didn't really deal very well with Baltimore's defense. And that game was in L.A., if I'm not mistaken, which kind of really wasn't a home game anyway. But it's definitely more of a it's, de- it's more of a neutral site. Correct. But Baltimore is not going to be a neutral site. Um, but. I still I th- I'm not sure that everyone on the on the charges was healthy, um, most notably, um, you know, Gordon, uh, the running back. So I'm going to I'm going to take the points. Um, and I think it will be a low scoring affair. Um, but I don't I'm not a big fan of rookie quarterbacks in in the playoffs. Do not have a very good track record. That that is true. Um, I I'm I'm I I'm torn on this one. I I agree with you on the rookie quarterbacks. I don't know how that's going to translate into the playoffs. The way Baltimore has has run their offense. Lamar Jackson has certainly brought a, an explosive nature to that offense that wasn't there before, and their defense has been – I mean, it's what you – it feels like a, a, a stereotypical Baltimore defense. It's a dominating defense. The Chargers looked like a different team all season up until the very end, and we we had talked about it a couple weeks ago after that big, huge win in Kansas City. This is This is their year. This is their year. They may, they're the best team. I, and I think I said at the time, I thought they were the team to beat in the AFC. And then they went out and then lost the following week. Who 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 did they end up losing to? Uh, what game was that? It was somebody they that they should have they should have won because the division was right there. The Chiefs were facing Seattle in a game that that you had to expect they were going to lose. And then the but the Chargers they lost to Baltimore, as you said, in what's essentially a neutral site for them. It, I mean, technically it was a home game, but they lost, they lost to Baltimore in, in LA. And now they get to go play them again. They didn't lose. And they put up, they got beat. They, they, they got, yeah, they got manhandled. Yeah. Uh, but they gave up. Uh, Melvin Gordon did not play. Points. Melvin Gordon did not play in that oh, game. No, Melvin Gordon did play in that game. He did. He did play in that game. He was he, not, he was he, not healthy. He was not himself. He was not necessarily healthy, Melvin Gordon, yeah. though he was he was present. Yeah, he was not. Um, you know, we we saw Melvin Melvin Gordon getting twelve carries in a game is not a Melvin Gordon day. And and Rivers had a terrible day, and I, I Philip Rivers, boy, the, and we talk about uh, quarterbacks and you know who's at the top of the NFL, and Rivers really had a tremendous season statistically. Rivers is missing. You know, he has no MVP award, correct? No Super Bowl appearance. Is he a Hall of Famer? I I, I feel like statistically his numbers are there, though it's in a, a period of high-octane offense. So those are somewhat inflated, as all quarterback numbers or all offensive numbers seem to be uh, from a passing standpoint. I, I feel like Rivers needs this playoff run. He, he really needs the Chargers to, to make that game to kind of solidify his legacy. I don't know. I, Baltimore is such a difficult place to play. And I don't think Baltimore is winning this Super Bowl this year. I, I, I don't think they can beat New England in New England. I don't think they can beat Kansas City in Kansas City, though they came close. Did they not? I mean, they, they gave Kansas City a scare. Did they not when they played? 
uh, hold on, I'm looking at it right okay. now. Um, that they that. um that was the first that was game the of the game season. Kansas City had no. That was uh no 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 that was the um that was the game that uh that that literally Kansas City came back at the very end. Baltimore was up in that game late in the fourth. You remember the Chiefs tied it and Jackson fum- I believe Jackson fumbled the ball. Uh Chiefs won that game 27-24. That was in week uh 14, I oh, believe it was. Gotcha. And uh they went to overtime. Uh Harrison Butker uh hit a field goal to 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 win it. Uh Butker had missed a field goal with as time as had expired, but that's a game that Baltimore was up 24-17 late like i said late in the fourth kansas city scored that winning touchdown with with a little bit over three minutes left in the game that game was in kansas city so baltimore did almost beat kansas city in kansas city i don't necessarily think despite andy reed's playoff shaky playoff history i I don't necessarily think that uh that kansas city is uh going to to lose to baltimore should they meet again I just feel like I'm I'm going to go with Baltimore on this one. I I think at home, tough place to play. I I think I think whatever they did the last time is going to work again this time. And I I it, you know the Chargers may put up a few more points. I think Baltimore will do just enough to win. I'm I'm going to go with the Ravens, and I hate the Ravens too. They're, they're just they're they've never been a the team I've rooted for or liked or enjoyed watching, and I hate picking them because I kind of would like to see the Chargers make a run. I just feel like this is going to end up another disappointment. I think we're just going to be looking back at it, saying, "God, this looked like this might be the Chargers' year like three or four weeks ago, and now it's already over." Which means I'll be wrong, and like you said, anyone listening, get to Vegas and. Go ahead and get your bets down or Mississippi or New Jersey or to your, your, your local bookmaker, I guess, where, wherever you make your, uh, wherever you make your, uh, your, your legal wagers at or, or illegal. We don't judge <clears throat> where I'm not going to, I'm not judging. I'm not encouraging, but I'm not judging. Um, so, uh, lead us into the final game. Because that's the one I have interest in more than any of these. Finally, we have Philadelphia. At Chicago, Chicago is the largest favorite of the weekend at six point favorite. Um, Philadelphia going in with St. Nick, Nick Foles, who is automatic recently in December and January. Um, Chicago has been very good this year. They have shown a lot of progress. Um Trubisky has definitely taken a step forward, a huge step forward. Um, their defense is arguably the best in football, although maybe you wouldn't have noticed that, known that a couple of weeks ago when they played the Giants. But for the most part, over the course of the year, it's been it's been the top defense in uh, in all of football. But there's something magical about Philadelphia at this time of the year, and it was. Let's be honest. It was a miracle that they even got into the playoffs. They had a, with a couple weeks left, they had a less than a 10% chance of getting into the playoffs. They needed a lot of things to happen. And um, when, when Nick Foles is at the, uh, at the helm of that team, things do tend to happen. This is a team that uh, made quite a uh, unexpected uh, uh, journey through the, uh, the playoffs last year and winning the whole thing. I don't think anyone really had them down to do that when once uh, once Wentz went Wentz down, over. right? So, um, yeah. so I uh, I know I know I know which way you're going to go, and I'm going to go the opposite way because I I believe <laughs> I believe in Saint Nick. Um, I and I'm not a Philly fan at all. I I hate the Eagles. Um, we have just passed Christmas. It was yeah. the season. For St. Nicholas. Right? Yep. And I'll take the points. I mean, you know, because I'm not sure that Chicago is going to blow out Philadelphia. I, I, if this game is, I, I think this game is going to be close either way. And I'll take the six points. And I will definitely take the, um, I'm going to take the over. I think this is going to be a little bit of a shootout. 
Are you taking Philly to win then? You said you're taking them to. to I'm the taking points. the point. I think you're I'm taking, taking the, the points because I think they're going to win. So you think you're? But uh, but I'll but I'll I can still win if they lose. You can. Uh, as a Bear fan, if I take my Bears to win, then I obviously I, I don't need to take them to cover. Uh, so I can kind of win and lose, or win win. It's not the way betting works with them not covering. Well, that's true. Um, I think it's going to be a closer game than six points. I think it's going to come down to to a, a defensive stand by the Bears at some point. Uh, I, the thing with the Bear defense is it was statistically, I do believe, the best defense in football by by most advanced metrics that you could find. They did have games, though, where somehow some – like you mentioned the Giant game where it's like, how are the Giants – how is how are the Giants putting up these points on them? And and part of that may have been they they were running out Chase Daniel instead of Trubisky. So the offense, not that the Bear offense didn't score some points, but it's a little bit different when the team offense dynamic is different when it comes down maybe to time of possession or how the offense controls the ball or 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 whatnot. It was not the same Bear team that that's obviously going to take the field against the Eagles today. Um. I know Nick Foles, the run he had last year was was Flacco-esque, dialing it back to a team that's in the playoffs but not starting the quarterback. We remember Flacco's ridiculous postseason in the year they beat the Niners in the Super Bowl, which is something he's never replicated since and got him that monster contract. Talk about great timing. I, Foles kind That's what Foles' run in the playoffs reminded me of last year because we've watched Nick Foles in Philly in a previous iteration with the Rams. We've seen him look really good at times and really terrible at times. And even at points this season, he's looked terrible and really good. And I don't know. I just, I can't believe lightning will strike twice with Philly and they're on the road. I think this is the game that, that bad Nick Foles shows up, but I'm still with Trubisky. As a Bears fan, I get asked what my thoughts are on Trubisky because the Bears did trade up to get him uh, last year, and they did so when they could have drafted Deshaun Watson. They could have drafted Pat, Pat Mahomes, obviously. Would I feel better if Mahomes was under center or even Watson than Trubisky? I, Mahomes, yes. I don't know about Watson. Trubisky and Watson actually share some – some similarities you you wouldn't think of Mitchell Trubisky as a scrambling quarterback even except for the fact he was he he ran for we we were talking about that a couple weeks ago his his rushing yardage for a quarterback was was up there uh, that's definitely a facet of his game he's i guess he's faster than he looks or or fat you know you wouldn't assume he he's a mobile quarterback but he is and you know, the Bears have some offensive weapons. Uh, Tariq Cohen is, an, is a huge X factor if they get the ball in his hands. And I'll just say as a Bears fan, I'm just thankful that John Gruden took the job in Oakland because I'm not sure Khalil Mack would be wearing a Bears uniform today if he hadn't. And uh, he he made all the difference. The Bear defense was already good and trending good, and Mack just pushed it over the top. So my feeling is the Bears are – Arguably one of the hottest teams coming into the playoffs. They only have that giant loss over over a number of weeks. They really finished the season strong. They ended up really closing that division out in dominating fashion. You know, they played in a game last week against Minnesota that in the end meant nothing. And they kind of knew even by the half it meant nothing. And they still went away and put their their boot down on Minnesota's throat to knock them out of the playoffs. And I, I loved that killer instinct they showed. Uh, we even talked about it, that it might have been when you mentioned earlier in this in, in our show today that cousin Kirk Cousins record against teams that are over 500 is so terrible. It might have been to the Bears advantage that they had lost last week because then they would have been facing the Vikings again and Kirk Cousins. But They didn't do that. They went out, put the Vikings out of their misery. And I just, I feel like out of the NFC teams, the bears are the, are the team that could, could knock off the saints or knock off the Rams. They've already beaten the Rams. 
I think they're, I don't, I'm not going to predict that they're going to go that far. So if they win this week, then when we have this conversation in a week and we talk about predictions involving the bears against a a much better team than the Eagles, potentially I'm going to, that that's where I'll have to see if my rose colored glasses. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to temper what you, what you said a little bit. They are nine and one in their last 10. Okay. Okay. That sounds very good. Yes. Okay. Included in those nine wins is a game against the Jets, a game against the Bills, two games against the Lions, a game against the 49ers, who were not particularly good this year, and two games against the Vikings. And we just talked about how bad um, Kirk Cousins is against g- good teams. They have that quality win against the Rams. Yep. And they lost to the Giants. They did lose to the Giants. And I, I th- and the funny thing was that giant loss came at a time where that was the same week, if I'm not mistaken, the Saints lost in Dallas. And I remember us talking about it. And I said after the Saint lost to Dallas that, you know, this is a sign that the Saints who was who were being looked at as the the favorites, obviously, in the NFC at the time, much as they are still now. I said, this is the blueprint. This is how you beat New Orleans. The Bears are the team that can beat them. And then like four days later, I'm telling you, yep, forget that. They lost to the Giants. Teams that win the Super Bowl don't lose games like this to teams like that. And when you went through that list of teams they've beaten, wow, that's not really. You mentioned at least one one team where a coach was fired. You mentioned uh, you know, Detroit where uh, Belichick coaching tree guy and Patricia looked looked dazed and confused and not in a Matthew McConaughey type of good way uh, it much 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 more like uh, uh again making Detroit pine for the days of Jim Caldwell perhaps uh it wasn't really an inspiring group of teams but to be fair you you have to beat the crappy teams that are in front of you if you're going to be a Super Bowl contender or even a playoff contender you and other than the Giants, they they did take care of business against all of those teams. <sighs> let me let me let me make it even worse for you. Uh, when they blew out Buffalo, uh, that was Nathan Peterman who was the quarterback. Nathan Peterman makes a good hot dog, doesn't he? I, I thought was, I thought he had a clothing line. Jay Peterman. I may, maybe that's maybe that's where I know him from. Um, Nathan P. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't think, you know, and here, here's the thing. I, 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 I know you talk about the bears being, you know, you, you think that they can do it and they can, they can get to where they need to be and beat the teams. Um, I, I, this interesting, uh, parallel, uh, that I heard the other day, which was that the saints in 2009, right. That was the year they won the super bowl. Is that correct? I b- believe it may be. I think it was 2009 um, that year. They went 13 and three and they lost three games. They lost to the Buccaneers, to the Cowboys and to the Panthers. This year they went 13 and three. They lost to the Buccaneers, the Cowboys and the Panthers. And the Panthers. Yes, they did. Uh, that's, that's very, uh, very telling perhaps. Deja vu all over again, as Yogi Berra would have would have yep. said, were yep. he still were he still alive. So if he were, yep, yeah. Uh, you know, well, I'm sticking with my Bears. I can't, I can't not. I maybe next week if they're still around, maybe that is, maybe that's the upset. Every week, uh, or every wild card weekend, it's rare. It feels to me like all the favorites win or all the teams you expect. There always seems to be at least one upset, if not multiple upsets. I, like I said, I think um, I, I went with Seattle. I thought that was definitely one. I think you said you did as well. I But would it surprise you if all four teams that are not favored won their games? I mean, none of those would be shocking if Indy, Seattle, the Chargers, and the Eagles all advanced. I mean, like you said, the Bear line at six points is the biggest one. The other ones are all essentially kind of close to pick them games. So it, it's going to be a good weekend of uh, – of football hopefully hopefully we'll see four really good games and and obviously we'll know more after this weekend about how things are shaping up and and what looks like uh 
maybe one of these teams emerges and looks really, really good this weekend. And we'll be talking next week about, wow, that team, that team might be the team to watch type of thing. So let's, uh, let's bust this out and close yeah. this down. We've been, uh, we've been doing this for an hour and a half. And yeah, for this is, this is a typical note, conversation note. for us. So, uh, yeah. But uh, but yeah, this will be the first episode of hopefully many more to come. We have a lot to talk about because there's one thing that that's going to be very difficult to do, and that's to shut either one of us up when it comes to subjects that we're passionate about, which especially are going to be, well, yeah, I can I can I can go on now now and then. Yeah. So but it does seem like a good time to wrap it up. So if you want to you want to close us out here, Stephen, we'll uh until our next episode. Yeah. I'd just like to thank everyone uh, for the two or three people who might listen to this. Say hello to uh, our wives because yeah. well, your wife will listen. I'm not sure my wife will. Uh, well, um, that remains to be seen. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but uh, you know, we'll catch us uh, next time where we will be back with uh, more ramblings of complete inconsequence um, on the next edition of, uh, excruciating minutiae. Yes. Thank you for listening and good night. Mm-hmm.